ready for this. Today, we are finishing the Ten Commandments. Can I get a whoop? Yeah, all right. So we're there. We're at the, uh, the last. This is the Tenth of the Commandments, and we've been on it for 11 weeks now. And uh, it's exciting. We could keep going. You know, we're looking for more and more commandments, but it's just, you know, they're, they're not there. So um, today is it. So we're in number 10. All right. So right there on the, on the screen, you can see the number 10 starting in verse 17. Uh, it says this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So we've been at this for a while, looking at each of these commandments as they come up, and they follow a familiar pattern, especially the last uh, five or six have all followed the same pattern of do not do what, right? There's a thing that comes in. Don't do something. What's the something in this case? It's to covet, okay? So again, it's following a very familiar pattern. In Hebrew, we've seen it over and over. So let's look at these Hebrew words. Uh, they are the do not, right? The do not do what? And in this case, it's the, these two words, lo, and, and if I'm going to say it correctly, it's chamad, but in English, it's chama. all right? So however you want to say it, lo chamad, or lo chama, um, up to you, all right? So these two words, and the lo is a prohibition. It's the absolutely not under no circumstances, uh, you find that in, you know, do not lie, do not cut, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not, uh, all of the, the do nots follow this same pattern. And so here this word of hamad or shama, right, it, it means don't covet. Yes, that's how it's translated in English, but it, it gets used in other ways. And often it's talking about a, a deeper desire or it gets used in the, the idea of setting your eyes on something that isn't yours. Okay, so... Job, in the book of Job, says that he has made a covenant with his eyes to not look upon a woman that is not his wife in a lustful way, right? That look upon is the same concept as that of covet, right? So it's this idea of don't set your eyes up to something that isn't yours. It doesn't come from the Lord. It's not given to you. It doesn't belong to you. You know, and if you're interested in it, maybe you should pray about it before you set your eyes on it, right? Spend some time letting God bring it into your life instead of you lusting after it. That's the concept. Okay, so the commandment, as written, as we've just heard it, yes, it makes that pretty clear, but it also does something pretty exciting for me, personally, as the preacher who's been doing this for several weeks. It uh, validates everything I've been saying. What do you mean? Well, it validates this idea. I've been saying over and over and over that each of the commandments is about more, right? It's about more than the simple command of do not steal, do not lie, do not murder, do not commit adultery. It's about much more than that, right? And so in this commandment, this commandment talks about this idea of do not set your eyes on, don't covet in your heart, don't want. Well, that's a hard thing to put on a piece of paper to say, you know, Ryan, you are guilty of coveting. Oh, yeah, prove it in court. Well, I can't. You know why I can't? Because it's a part of your heart, right? It's a character issue. And I've been saying this for weeks, and, you know, some of you have been on track with me going, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm with you. I can kind of see how that works. But now, ha-ha, at the end, it wraps it all up, and, you know, all of your resistance was futile. Right? It really is about your character. What we have seen in all Ten Commandments, what we have seen over and over and over, are the values that God holds dear. And he's making these values known to the people who will be called by his name. And if you want to be the people who are called by the name of Yahweh, the name of God, then see the values that he is presenting to his people, saying, these are the things that I value for you. Mirror them. Mirror them in your own character, in your own value system. Take them on board, learn them, and make them a part of your heart. Don't just tick the box. I didn't murder anyone today. Hoorah! Instead, go deeper. What did you do in your heart today that mirrors God's heart towards others? Right? That's the question that we are needing to ask. And that's what this commandment brings us to. It shows us, again, that what God cares about most 
What God cares about most is what's inside. He cares about our heart, cares about our character, cares about who we are and who we will become, who we are being made into. I love that about the commandments, right? It's not about building a new religious order of tick the boxes to make God happy. Oh, you couldn't tick that box, now God's mad at you. Right, that's what religion tells us. But clearly, even in this 10th commandment, you see that it's not about religion because religion doesn't work with the things of the heart. This is about relationship. This is about how do, how do I submit my nature to the nature of God? How do I submit my heart to the heart of God? How do I ask the Lord to work in me day after day after day to begin to mirror his values and the way that I treat myself, the way I treat him, and the way I treat the people around me? It's powerful. One commandment brings it all home. All right, that's it. I'm, I'm done. I want us to learn this lesson so intensely. I, I'm really passionate about this, as you might imagine. And, uh, and I want to get into it by listening to a story that illustrates the whole purpose of the 10th tenth, tenth commandment. Now, this is an encounter between Jesus and a, a rich man who could have had one of the greatest opportunities in his life. He could have been the 13th apostle. You think, well, that would throw off our whole biblical numerology plan, right? Oh, and now I can't predict the, uh, the coming of Jesus because I don't have the numbers right. Oh, darn. You know, he could have been the fifth beetle. That's how, that's how big this invitation was and this encounter between Jesus and this man. So we're going to find it. This, this man's story is found in all the synoptic gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? But we're going to be looking in Mark chapter 10. So Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17, we're going to hear this encounter between Jesus and what is sometimes called the rich young ruler, but in this case, we just know him as a rich man. So Mark 10, 17 says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. If you want to know what that's about, it's all about identity, right? Jesus is saying, who do you think I am? Okay, look at verse 18, uh, sorry, verse 19. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, this is a legitimate opportunity for this man, right? He had the real opportunity to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. This opportunity to become a disciple came with a challenge, right? A test of faith. It was a hard challenge. It was one that the man didn't really see the purpose and meaning behind. He didn't understand why I have to do what with my wealth? And, and I don't see the connection between these two things. But, you know, this idea of being called into a place of service through a challenge from God, this isn't new. This isn't novel. It's not strange. The apostles themselves, we, we've heard about many of their encounters with Jesus and how they were called into a place of testing before they said yes to Jesus and before they stepped out in faith. They had to practice their faith. They didn't just say they believed. They had to do something about it in order to start this journey with Jesus. Think about it. When, uh, when Jesus met up with Peter, James, and John, and there was Andrew around the corner, and they were all out doing some fishing, and Jesus said, I'm going to get in your boat, we're going to push offshore. He gave a great teaching, he said, now let's go out and go fishing after you've been out all night, haven't caught anything. Oh, yeah, joy of joys. But the guys did it, right? Maybe out of respect because he was a, a well-known rabbi, so you just want to do the right thing. Maybe that's not about faith, so they go out in the water. And while they're out there, in the middle of the day, which is not when you're supposed to do fishing, 
Uh, you're out there in the middle of the day. Jesus says, now, I want you to throw your net on the other side of the boat. If you've ever wanted to know what that means, I, I've experienced enough fishing failure in life to be a, a legitimate expert on this. You see, the, when the currents are flowing, right, going this direction, that's my hula, all right, when they're flowing this way, you throw your net out and you pull back against the current and the little fishies go, ah, I can't swim away, and they get caught and then they become lunch, all right? It's very simple. Right, and net fishing is probably the easiest and should be, for most people, the most effective way to fish. I've tried it a lot. I, I catch nothing. I did catch a boot one time, so that was fun. Not a German boat, uh, a boot. Okay. But when you throw on the other side, right, the river's going this way, and you throw that way, and you pull with the current, what's going to happen to those little fishies? They're going to be like, whatever, man. Swim away. You catch nothing. Maybe that has been my problem. And so Jesus is doing something really that defies logic, it defies physics, it defies everything that a fisherman knows. And these guys were in a crucible uh, of faith. They were in a place of a crisis. They had to decide, do we do what this crazy rabbi tells us to do? Or do we tell him, you know, look, man, it's been a long night. We're rowing back to shore. But they passed the test, right? They said, okay, well, what the heck? Let's just do what he says. We trust that he is somehow or another, he's got a plan here. And there's some good that can come out of this. And so they throw it on the wrong side and lo and behold, they catch the biggest haul that they've had in a very long time. And so they pull that all on board, and they're all amazed. And in that moment, with the fish all around and all the guys are all excited, Peter, he responds to this event by recognizing Jesus, not the miracle. Right? Everyone else is excited about the miracle. Peter recognizes Jesus. He falls on his knees in front of Jesus and says, Go away from me, Lord because I am a sinful man. So Peter's faith is made clear through his repentance. His acknowledgement, I am a broken man, I am a sinful man. I, I shouldn't be in the presence of the King of Kings. And Jesus replies to him and to all that are listening, he says, I will make you fishers of men. I, I from now on, don't be afraid, from now on you will be catching men. You'll be catching people with the rest of your life. And then I don't want us to lose the fact that they load all their gear up. They come back to shore. They unload everything. They sell off the fish. They do all the stuff that they have to do. And the, all of these men, all four of them that are involved, they all walk away from their boats, from their capital investments, from their careers, from their future financial security. They walk away from their family of origin that had always lived in this village. And they, they become disciples of Jesus, going where Jesus goes, doing what Jesus tells them to do. See the change that happens in them. They face the crucible of faith, the crisis of faith. And you might look at that and think, that what a weird thing for Jesus to do. But these guys understood that this, what Jesus is telling us to do is so outside of what we think we should be doing this is a real test for us. We're going to say yes to God, even if we don't understand the other side. They received a blessing for sure, but more than that, they became disciples. Right? The call to discipleship comes with a call to action. And that's what we see with them. And so if we go back to Jesus encountering with this rich man, we see that the rich man didn't understand what was going on for him either. So let's walk back through his story for a second. So this rich man, he knows that Jesus is going to be passing by. And it says here that he runs up to Jesus. Right? He runs up to him, falls on his knees in public in front of Jesus, and begs Jesus to tell him, how can I inherit eternal life? You know, if I, if I saw you at the shops after church today, if you went for some lunch and you see me on the other side and I run across the shops towards you, beeline, right at you, what are you going to do? You're going to get nervous. <laughs> even if you recognize me, even because you recognize me, you're going to get really nervous. <laughs> All right? If I run straight up to you and I fall down on my knees in front of you, in front of the, everybody at Big W, 
And I'm, I'm begging you, you know, grabbing hold of your pant legs. I'm just like, I'm begging you to buy me a Coke, no sugar. I mean, that's weird, right? That would be so strange and so desperate in our culture. And trust me, it was, no, it was more, no more normal for him, right? It was just as weird, just as embarrassing, just as culturally out of the norm to be a powerful, rich person and to be running in public, number one, and two, to be begging this nobody, this, this Jewish rabbi, this guy from the Galilee, begging him to tell you, how can I have eternal life? And so what he's asking of Jesus is interesting. He says, how can I inherit? How can I receive? How can I be bestowed upon this gift of eternal life? This guy doesn't totally understand what he's asking for, but he's asking for what he thinks he needs. Right? He believes that there is a God. He believes that heaven is real. He believes that God will give somebody, somewhere, the access to heaven. He wants to be a part of that. This is why we need to tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because people have a hunger in them for the things of God. Haley earlier showed that picture on the wall of the James Webb telescope. All right, I have my opinions about all that stuff, but we won't get into it now. But that, that hunger, the, the, the way that people leapt at these images to show that there is something greater than us, something much bigger than our small experience, people have a hunger in them to know more about the eternal, to know more about what is beyond us. This man is expressing that hunger before Jesus. He comes to Jesus and says, tell me what I need to know. And that's where the gospel kicks in and says, fine, let me tell you about God. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about relationship over religion. Let me tell you about what Christ has done for you. Now Jesus in reply, let's look at his reply. Jesus replies to the man and he says something that defies logic for us. When we hear it, we're just like, I don't, honestly don't know what Jesus is doing here. Instead of telling him about the, uh, the, his need, he's a sinner and he needs grace and that Jesus is the bridge that crosses the span, you know, the whole symbol thing. Instead of doing the whole gospel presentation, he says, you need to keep the commandments. Which ones specifically? <laughs> he says, uh, how about the ones that are all outward actions? Murder, adultery, theft, false testimony, lying, honoring your parents. Things that are measurable. He says, go, do these things. I can imagine that the man was a bit disappointed. But I can imagine he was probably frustrated and disappointed with that. He came to Jesus looking for something different. Jesus was different. He wasn't like the religious teachers. He wasn't like the scholars. He wasn't like the, the Pharisees on the corner. He could see that this man has a relationship with the Heavenly Father and what he does, no one else does. The way that he speaks, no one else speaks. There's something special about this man. He comes to Jesus and instead he gets told, you already have everything you need. Go and follow the commandments. I can imagine him being disappointed. He was looking for something new, something different. I get that. As a preacher, I get asked all the time for something fresh. Invent something. <laughs> nope. Instead, I can point you back to what we've already been given. All right, that's not exciting for people. They don't want that. I don't want to have to go back and read the Bible for myself to get wisdom from God. You give it to me. Right? That's, that's the frustration. And so anyway, he's asking for this, this give me something new. And Jesus addresses his struggles. Now remember, we've been talking about this for 10 weeks. For 10 weeks, we've been looking at the fact that there is this weird view, this traditional view of the commandments. And honestly, I've heard it from a lot of you that you've, held, you've inherited this view yourself. That basically says that as long as you can tick the box next to the commandment, that's it. That's all you've got to care about. You know, do I worship more than one God? No, tick that box. Do I, uh, do I worship idols? Nah, no, tick that box. Do I use God's name in vain? I mean, not seriously occasionally, but nah, nah, we're going to tick the box anyway. 
Do I take time out to be in church? Well, preaching in the choir, yeah. Tick, 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 tick. Everybody gets, everybody gets a tick today. You know, do you honor your family? Yeah, enough. Yeah, I'm close. I, I do what I can. Tick. Have I killed anybody? Nah, 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 I'm good there. Have I lied? Well, not much lately, so I uh, have to. Or how about stealing? All right, how, how about adultery? Ooh, nah. All right, so we're going to take that for today. You know, that's, that's the mentality of this idea that we look back on these commandments and we say they are just, these are the guidelines, follow the guidelines, and you're going to be good. Is that what Jesus is saying to this man? No. No, he makes it very clear. In fact, he says, like the man is able to say back to Jesus, which is something that I wouldn't know how to say, but the man says back to Jesus, yeah, 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 I've done all that since I was a boy. Yeah, ticked all those boxes, buddy. I follow those commandments. And Jesus looks at him and he says he loves him, right? He shows him that he loves him. It's not about embarrassing him. It's not a trap. He's not trying to hurt the man. Instead, he says to him, okay, you lack something. You know, when you love someone, you tell them the truth, even if it stings, even if it's not what they want to hear. And Jesus loves the man, and so he tells them the truth. He says, yes, I see that you believe that you have ticked all these boxes, that you have been doing all that you're supposed to be doing. I see that you believe that, but you lack something. There's something missing in your heart. So in verse 21, Mark 10, 21, Jesus tells them, this is what I want you to do. He says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. For a long time, I have to admit, I've struggled to understand what, how these two things go together. The man seeking relationship with God and Jesus calls the man to go and sell everything he has and give it away to the poor. The way I I don't understand them, and I haven't understood that, is because I look around and say, well, obviously, maybe this is, everyone needs to have the vow of poverty, right? So surely Jesus must have told a lot of other people the same thing, except that I don't find it anywhere else. In fact, there are a lot of people, believe it or not, there are a lot of people in the New Testament that are both godly and wealthy, right? If just off the top of my head, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, That is where, it was his vineyard, it was his tomb that the body of Jesus was laid after the cross. It was in his tomb that Jesus was resurrected. He was a wealthy disciple. Joseph of Cyrus, everybody knows him, right? Otherwise known as Barnabas. You've heard of him? He was the one who funded Paul's missionary journeys by selling off so much of his own personal wealth. He gave of himself and God used his wealth to carry the gospel out into the world. Phoebe, a wildly wealthy woman in Rome, funded the Roman church, funded Paul's mission in and out of Rome. A couple, Priscilla and Aquila, they owned what would essentially be like a block of flats in downtown Sydney. Right? In the middle of Rome, they had a huge house, a huge villa that the whole church gathered in, in the whole Roman area would come to their house and they were so well respected and loved and so rich that nobody messed with them and the church could meet in their house unmolested. Even one of the apostles, Levi, otherwise known as Matthew, he was a tax collector, had great wealth. Jesus didn't tell him to go sell everything he has, give it to the poor and come follow me. What about Nicodemus, John chapter 3? Here's a man with great wealth, great power. Jesus didn't tell him that his stumbling block was his wealth, that he had to get rid of it. There's a lot of examples I can look at, and I'm like, why? Why is Jesus focusing on this man and telling this man he needs to go and sell all that he possesses and give it away to the poor in order to begin this journey of faith and discipleship? When he hasn't done it with others, what's going on with this man? And the moral of the story is, that it's not about the money. It's not about the wealth. It's not about what he possessed. It's about what's in his heart. Right? It's about what's going on in this man. I'm going to let Jesus explain what he's doing here. We're going to listen to a parable that Jesus gave, and you've heard this parable before. It's the parable of the soils, right? But we're going to come back to this story 
Okay, we're going to come back to the encounter, so don't think we're done here. But I want us to hear from Jesus. I want him to explain himself. And this particular parable, the parable of the soils, found in Luke chapter 8, verse 5, helps us to see very clearly what's going on in this situation. How does it relate to the 10th commandment? You're going to hear it all. So let's look at that. So chapter 8, verse 5, Luke 8, 5. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he had said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the point of this part of the the parable, the thing that you're supposed to ask yourself is, what kind of soil do I want to be? Right, if you're just listening to Jesus and he tells that that parable, and you might not understand what he's getting at, but you, you understand that in this assortment of soils, you should probably pick the good one. That sounds about right. All the others didn't work. The good soil is productive and fruitful, and the odds are most people listening would go, yeah, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to be the good soil. Do I know what that means? No, I don't. And in fact, his disciples said the same thing a little bit later when they were privately uh, away from the crowd. They asked, can you explain this to us? And so Jesus did. So Luke chapter 8, verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Now, I have spent a long time in the past on this parable. I'm going to get straight to the point. What is the idea being given here? Jesus says the seed is the word of God. What does that mean? Well, the word of God is the written word of God. It's also the word that the spirit speaks to us out of this word. The spirit of truth has been given to us as followers of Christ to take what God has given in his written word and make it real and applicable to our lives. And the word of God is the person and the example of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so the word of God is all that encompasses of, what, of who God is as you understand it. As God gives you his wisdom and his truth, that's the seed falling on the soil. So you have these soil types, all right? The first is the hard soil. And on the hard soil, the seed bounces. The path just bounces off. Now, a lot of people do a lot of focusing on the fact that it says, oh, the devil comes away and takes the word away from them. Well, you know what? It wasn't going to get in anyway. Right? When your heart is hard toward the things of God, it doesn't matter if it's a bird or the devil or your sister that comes along, you're not going to accept what God tells you. Right? That's his point. When you're in a place where you don't, you don't want to hear it, you don't care what God has to say to you, you're not interested in the things of God because either you're hurt or you're offended or you're in a place of trial or you just don't want to hear it anymore. You're sick of it. Right? Your heart is hard. Then he talks about the rocky soil. Okay, these are those, and you know, we all have been in each of these places at different times. Right? If, if that weren't true, Jesus wouldn't be telling you about the good soil to get you to move to the good soil. Right? If it was a description of this is who you are and you'll never change, it would be a different, this, this doesn't work, come on, understand the parable. And so here's the rocky soil. These are the people that hear the word of God. All right, so something happens in their life. They go to church, they're in a worship service, they go to a camp, they're at a retreat, they're listening to worship in their car, 
and something from God comes in and it makes it into their heart and they're like, yeah, I love this. Emotionally, I'm charged, I'm happy. This pumps me up, gives me joy. I'm on a high with Jesus. But then you come back home. You go to work. You know, you've got a little baby who doesn't sleep all night long. The next morning you get up, there's no high, there's no joy, there's no fun. The emotions are gone, and so is the Word of God. You don't apply it to your life, you don't follow through on it, it's gone, because the emotion is gone. And he talks about the good soil, right? The good soil is there. These are the willing. One of the things we talk about in church all the time is that our church exists for the willing, Right? If you're in a place where you are willing to receive from God, you are willing to invest in your own spiritual journey, you are willing to become a disciple, to step out in faith, you will grow. We can't make you grow. You have to be the good soil. You have to be willing to embrace what God is doing in your life and to seek to turn over those things in your life that are not, not good for growth and to get rid of the stones and get rid of the junk Break up that hardened soil in your heart. All right, and those who are ready for that and willing, you're going to produce an incredible harvest of righteousness. Not a harvest of blessings, not a harvest of miracles, not a harvest of riches, but of righteousness. You will be seeking the things of God, doing what God wants for you to do because you want to do it. That's what the good soil looks like. Now you might have noticed I skipped a soil. Ooh, did, did I? I don't know. Let's look at verse 14. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. What happens? You receive what God has given you, you take it on board, it even begins to grow. But it never matures. What does that mean? That means we hear the things of God. We hear the message of his word. We're engaged with worship. We're engaged with God at some level. But we don't apply it to our lives in such a way that it starts to take root in us and we begin to change, producing fruit. We don't mature. Why don't we mature? The 10th commandment is why. Because of covetousness, because of our lust for the things of this world, because of our desire for the stuff around us that isn't from God, that is the weed, right? That is the thorn. That is the thing that's growing up around us and it chokes out the life and it pulls us down. The pleasures of the world, riches, and our own interest in our own fame, our status in the world. These are the things that make us struggle, that make us immature. So we go back to the situation between Jesus and this rich man. Listen again. All right, we're going to listen again. This is Jesus' reply to his claim to have kept the commandments in verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad, not angry. He didn't go away shaking his fist at Jesus and saying, that nut job, what a crazy man. I can't believe he would say that. That's nuts. Instead, he went away sad because he recognized that his love was for his wealth. He saw very clearly. He was exposed. The word of God exposed him. This is not a call to reject wealth. It is a call for this man to see that he is coveting the things of this world, that they are the thorns wrapped around his heart, and they are choking out the love and the life that God wants for him. He will not mature in his faith. He will not take that step of faith and put it into action and become the man of God that he is intended to be, the disciple that he could be. And the reason why is because he can't keep the 10th commandment because of his covetousness. His lust for the things of the world was greater than his interest even in eternal life. 
His love of the things of the world is greater than his love of salvation. And so because he was covetousness, because of his covetousness, because he was coveting, and he coveted, he did all of those things. Because of all this, he turned his back on Jesus. I mean, see it. He is the thorny soil. He is the embodiment. He is the living embodiment of what Jesus taught in that parable of the soils. He has had the life choked out of him by his love of the things of this world. And now I have a sad comment for you. It's the close of our series. It is. It is. I know. Tears. Tears. I want us to close by listening to a passage I've, I've brought up several times throughout the whole study. And it it needs to be where we finish. It comes to us out of Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. Verse 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God's love for you is not casual. It's not occasional. God loves you in all circumstances. Even when you are unlovable, God loves you. Not just when it's easy, when you're doing the right stuff, but even when you're in the place of absolute, abject failure, God loves you. God's love for you, see it. He is jealous for you. And he is a consuming fire. He will not stop pursuing you because he loves you. Our response to that kind of love needs to mirror the love of God. Our love for the Lord cannot be casual and occasional. We can't today decide, I love the Lord, but tomorrow... I love my wealth and my status, and I will reject Christ. That's not what love looks like. See the love of God. See the unconditional, all-consuming fire of God's love that he has for you. And in response, you need to see that it's time for you to be all in with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to again hear your word. And Lord, we ask that you would expose in us whether we are in the place of hardship, God, whether we're in a place of coveting, whether we're in a place, Lord, where we are, we are struggling to receive what is real and from you. Or God, are we at a place today where we're ready to say yes to you? We're willing. Our hearts are open to you. Lord, I hope that we are. And I hope that we are the good soil standing before you and saying, Lord, we want to be productive. We want to be fruitful. We want to produce righteousness in our lives. We want to live for you. We want to glorify you. We are the people called by your name, and we are proud of that truth. Help us to live it out. Help us to mirror what we see in your heart. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We continue in worship, so we're going to take communion together. The, the team's going to lead us in a reflection while we do that. So if you will go around the room, grab your pieces, come back to your seat, and spend this time in prayer and worship.
dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in law for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. The coach of Christ was born and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name and in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me stands between you and your obedience to Christ today? What challenge is God giving you? Are you at a place where you're ready to fall on your knees before Jesus? And to say, you are the Lord, and it's because of you I am saved. It's because of you I have been forgiven. It's because of you I have eternal life. For you, I will live. We praise Jesus as we take this bread and this cup of his hand. Let's pray. Lord, as we go out from this place, Lord, help us to go looking deeply into your heart and seeking to mirror what we find. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you've told us over and over and over you care about what's in our hearts who we are, who we are becoming and we thank you for leading us in that process thank you Jesus